Welcome back friends and in this episode of Anthony Edits Your Photos we're going to be using Luminar Neo to see if we can bring out the best in this image here sent in by Fran Lyons. Recently I've had a few comments asking me if I would just slow down on the delivery of my content and so in this video that is exactly what I'm going to do. Now although I don't know the exact direction that my editing on this is going to take as yet, I do have one intention and that is to keep the tool usage to an absolute minimum. Just keep things really simple so that you guys can understand that you can achieve very good results just with a limited tool set. You don't need to throw everything that is inside Luminar Neo at your photos to get a good result. Oftentimes the first the you go with your post-production, the more tools you throw at something, things can get away on you. So keep it simple and be intentional with every tool that you apply. Now one way to look at photo editing is kind of like visual problem solving. You look at your image and you think, what do I need to fix in this photo? When Fran sent me in this photo, she mentioned a couple of problems that the image had. I've actually identified a third problem, so let's take a look at the photo and see what those issues are and then we'll look at how we can fix them. So this stunning astro photo that I sent in by Fran Lyons was shot at Superstition Mountains, east of Phoenix, Arizona. Now some of the things Fran's pointed out as concerns would be the light pollution from the city here. Also she's concerned that the image is too bright and blown out and she's struggling to get the same sort of contrast that I got in my last video where I covered astrophotography. And beyond that her biggest concern is the noise that is present in the photo. So this was shot at ISO 3200 which is quite common for astrophotography. Now of course you're going to suffer from noise at that high ISO level. How much depends on how good your camera sensor is and so that's certainly something we want to fix up. However, a couple of the other things that are issues for me is because of how wide we're shooting we're actually picking up a very dark vignette around here which could be the camera picking up the lens hood itself or it could be a case of the light projection coming through the lens isn't quite filling the whole of the camera's sensor. But in any case that is something that we need to resolve and the other issue which Fran has not mentioned is that the photo is actually out of focus. And when we're in this fit to screen view it's not immediately evident that we are out of focus but if I use my scroll wheel or my mouse to actually come in you can see the soft edge around the rocks here and you can also see that the stars are also soft. And one of the big telltale signs when you're dealing with astrophotography is these little stars should actually be pins of light. However, if you look really carefully, they actually look more like little donuts and that is a byproduct of your lens not being perfectly focused on those stars. So again, we're gonna see if we can actually fix that up. So while this is most definitely a stunning photo, we've certainly got our work cut out. So the first place I want to start is develop raw and I would always recommend that this is the first place you start. If you're unfamiliar with all of these settings inside develop raw and you're brand new to photo editing, then it's probably worth jumping into enhance AI and just sort of leveraging what Luminar can do for you itself because it's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of correcting your photo for you. However, that's not how I like to play things. I like to work directly in the develop mode and take full control. Now you can see here that the develop raw option is gone. Now why is that? That is literally because I've opened up the tool above, the Enhance AI or any other tool for that matter, as soon as you've done that, the option for develop raw disappears. And that is because once you've set that foundational raw data and moved the exposure, highlights, all of that stuff where you want it to, Beyond that, as we layer more tools on top, we're no longer working on that raw data. But don't think that it's gone completely. Don't think, oh no, I've missed my chance. I haven't done my raw editing. Even though it looks the same, it's not the raw file. What you want to do is jump back into the edit section here and you can see that, look, here we have Enhance AI, which was a tool that we started playing around with, but we didn't even do anything to it, but it's been added to the tool layer stack. So we'll delete that, but below it, which has now disappeared, was my develop raw. I'm not gonna cover how to set up your camera specific profiles in this video, but if you have access to them, if you've set that up, absolutely go with one of your camera matching profiles if you would like me to cover that. Again, I'm waiting for enough people just to say that's of interest to me, so let me know in the comments if it is. So the first thing I want to do is just drop the exposure just so we're feeling like it's a little bit more like nighttime. The next thing I want to look at is the smart contrast. Like I really feel like this image just needs to be a little more punchy. And anything we're doing in terms of darkening that vignette even further around the extremities of the photo, I'm not even worrying about that because I am going to deal with that. In terms of highlights, we could absolutely brighten those up just so that we're getting a little bit more punch into the Milky Way itself. The shadows as well need lifting because if I bring those back down, you can see that we're really losing detail in all this amazing rock formation here. And so I wanna see that, you know, even if we're adding contrast later on in our editing, I at least wanna see it during my initial develop raw. 
we might even be able to take that just a little further. And to keep track of where we've come from, where we've got to, of course, we could come down here to the preview icon and just click that eyeball and we can see our before, let go and we see our after, or alternatively, the way I prefer to do it is just with the backslash key on my keyboard. So I can go to the before with holding the backslash key. As soon as I release, I'm back to our edited version. And of course, if we want to see the effects of just any one tool, we come up to the eye preview icon just on that tool, see our before and our after. Effectively, that's doing the same thing because this is the only tool we have at the moment, but that's the way to do that as well. Let's open up the blacks and whites and just see by boosting up the whites whether we can actually expand the tonal range. You can see in our histogram here that we don't have a full distribution of data, i.e. the right hand side of the histogram, there's nothing showing there. This distribution here, and if I click it until it just goes grey, we're just looking at the luminosity values here, the brightness, and it's saying we have a little bit of black, a lot of dark shadowy areas quite a bit in the mid-tones and then it drops off just over midway. So we have nothing really in the brighter part of the image. So I'm gonna grab the white slider here and just start pulling that up and look at the change in the shape of that histogram now. I don't wanna take it all that way to be honest. Um, I'm gonna do this a little bit by eye. Like if we just look at the histogram, you'd think, oh yeah, that's pretty good based on the histogram, but things are just getting a little bit washed out, a little bit bleached out. And if you wanna see pixels that are turning to pure white, obviously we can just click this little icon here and now we can see via those little red dots, there's no real color information in those pixels anymore. And so even if you do wanna push things up towards white, you don't really want to do that in your initial pass. And so I'm happy for the actual stars themselves to go to pure white, but I don't wanna push the surrounding area to pure white. So something like that might be okay. I don't need to worry about the black point because our histogram distribution already shows us that we're starting that tonal range already at pure black. So I'm happy with that. The next tool I'm gonna to look at is the curves tool, and this is so super powerful. You guys know how this works. If we put a point by clicking and move it up, it's gonna brighten things up. If I pull it below that 45 degree angle, it's gonna darken things down. Obviously, this is a nighttime photo, so we want to be airing on the darker side. However, I don't wanna pull this down so I lose all of that detail that I worked hard to bring back in the foreground. So what I am gonna do is just bring down a point on the right hand side of the curve and that's gonna predominantly talk into the highlights. But because of the shape of this curve and we see it's dipping down below the 45 degree line here, we know that we're also darkening the shadows. So what I could do is just click there and actually just lift that point back up. And now I'm not darkening down the shadows as much, it's more focusing around darkening those highlights. And again, I'm gonna press the backslash key on my keyboard to see where I've come from and where I've got to, and I'm happy with my progress, so I'm gonna move on to the white balance. And I think this is gonna make a big difference. Currently our white balance is as shot, and if that's being based off of what the camera thinks the white balance should be at this time of night, it's not gonna be a very accurate color balance. And that is because it's so dark at that time of night that the camera really doesn't have access to enough light information to make an accurate judgment on what the temperature should be. So I'm just gonna grab the temperature slider and move it down so that the sky is a little bluer, and I feel that the colors are a little more true. You can take this as far as you like, and just like I recommend with all sliders, I recommend just playing around with them, like push them all the way up, bring them all the way to the left, and from there you're in a better place to make a good judgment call on where you feel it would sit best. I don't think the tint's too bad, but we could have a little play with that, and I'm thinking maybe we just wanna boost that up just a little bit. Because the light at nighttime is so limited, the human eye actually doesn't really register color very well. So if you want a more accurate representation of what you see at nighttime, you actually wanna take your saturation level down. However, this is an artistic interpretation. I don't wanna really reduce too much of that saturation. I'm enjoying the blue complementing the orange tones that we've got going in the foreground here. So I think we'll leave that somewhere around there. Now the sharpness and noise reduction tools that we have access to here, normally they do a pretty good job if you have a relatively good level of sharpness to begin with, or you don't have too much noise. But look, let's see what we can do with the sharpness slider. So I'm gonna crank this all the way to 100. And as you can see, it's just amplified that noise. I'm gonna turn off that warning dialog that tells us where we're peaking to pure white, just so we can see things a little bit clearer. And if I take this to the left, 
and release it and then push it up. You can see that we are sharpening things up, but we're pretty much doing it just on a pixel level. So one option we have is to actually increase the radius of the sharpening. And if we want to try masking some of that out so we're not adding as much noise, we can push the masking slider up as well. And that's gonna help us a wee bit, but to be honest, it's just adding more noise. And so I'm gonna bring that back down a fair way, just so we're introducing a little bit of the sharpness, but not too much. Later in the video, I'll show you my tool of choice for dealing with sharpening and noise reduction as well. But for now, let me just grab the luminosity noise reduction. And we'll push that all the way to 100. Let Luminar do a little calculation. And now you can see that, yes, we have reduced some of the noise, but a lot of it is still left behind. And so we end up with what I consider to be a little bit of a dirty file. I'm not really very happy with this effect. And so we might want to just give the file a little bit of a helping hand and push in a little bit of that noise reduction, but I really don't want to go too far with that. And again, we can use our backslash key to see our before and release to show our after. And I think that just shows that while the sharpness tool and the luminosity noise reduction normally do a really good job if you don't have excess need for either one of them, in a situation like this, they kind of fall short. So later in the video, I'm going to show you a couple of tools that can absolutely help us so much for this kind of work. So stay tuned for that. But for now, let's carry on just working on the edit and see if we can't get the overall image looking how we want it. So let's address the unwanted darkening around the edge of the frame. Normally, when you're shooting with a wide angle lens, you're very likely going to suffer from what is known as barrel distortion. And that is the warping of the edges of your photo, almost as if you're looking at your image through the bottom of a milk bottle, which isn't what we're after. So normally the way to fix that would be to jump into the optics section, click auto distortion corrections, and Luminar Neo will try to correct for any lens distortion as you've just seen here from the image changing. It does that by referencing the metadata in the raw file. It will know what your lens is and it knows how to correct for that. However, this isn't the approach I want to take with this image because if I turn it off again, we'll see that we're actually losing a lot of the foreground information just by turning that on. And if we look at the very bottom right of the image here, it looks as if the land just drops away into nothingness. And I don't really like that. It's a little disconcerting. I feel like we need to just keep the land visible in that bottom area of our frame. So I'm just going to turn that off. And instead of using that approach for this one, what I'm going to do is actually just jump into the crop tool. We can use the original ratio and that's going to keep everything confined to that same three by two. However, I think I'm just going to freestyle this one. So I'm just going to click free. I'm going to drag this somewhere towards the center. And now I'm actually free just to start moving these handles so that I can frame this photo exactly as I want it. And so as you can see on the right hand side here, we're getting that darkening. So I literally just want to pull my crop in until I can't see any more or minimize that darkening at least. And I'm going to do the same on this side. So I'm just going to bring in a little bit. We've got a little bit of darkening still top left and top right. So I'm just going to bring this down here. And I think this is going to make a little bit more of an interesting crop as it is. So I'm just going to close this down. And as you can see from the grid that's overlaid, we are sort of working to the rule of thirds there. Now let's look at bringing out a little bit more detail in the Milky Way itself. And just like with photo editing in general, there are so many different ways that I could tackle this and there is no right and wrong way. It's just the way that's going to get the job done. And so on any given day, I may actually use a different tool to deal with this. And today I'm thinking the best thing to do is actually jump into Structure AI and I'm just going to crank the amount all the way to 100 and see what happens. OK, and straight away we've got more local contrast going on through the Milky Way here. Let's see what happens if we boost it up look we get even more of that effect going on absolutely if i toggle our before and after of that tool it's far too much however that's where our masking comes in we can be really aggressive with the tool itself look at what we like what we don't like and then come in and just paint this effect in with varying amounts as to where we want it if you want to be featured on Anthony Edits Your Photos, please send them into anthonyeditsyourphotos at gmail.com. Let me know a little bit of the background behind the photo, where you shot it, why you shot it, and certainly let me know the issues that you're having in terms of post-production with the photo, and that will give me something to aim at in terms of achieving the results you're after. Please understand if you sent me photos to edit or just simply asking me questions and I haven't got back to you, firstly, my apologies, but my time is limited, and so I do prioritize the guys who are supporting me, keeping me in coffee, through Rubim, channel members, channel supporters. So those guys get my priority. And if you do have questions, please leave them in the comments. I'm much more likely to answer there. And if I'm not able to, someone else might just jump in and solve your problem for you. So I'm going to jump into the masking section. I'm going to choose a brush in this instance, and we're going to paint this effect in. 
in. I don't want to just jump straight in with 100% of this because it's not going to look good at all. I want to be able to build it up. And so I'm going to bring the strength down. Let's sit that somewhere around 20%. I'm going to increase the size of my brush just by clicking on the right bracket key on my keyboard. Click once and then I'm just going to paint once across the Milky Way. And so currently we have that structure AI effect that we've just applied. If I jump, if you close your tool down by mistake and you reopen it and you think, well, oh, it's got none of my settings. Where's everything gone? Obviously, that's just been dropped into the edit section here. So you just need to go there and you'll refine that tool you were just working on. And now we can go back into our masking. The painting we just did across the Milky Way, that is still there and we're free to click and just paint again. And so now I'm doubling up on that effect. And now if I release and we look at our before and after, you can see that we've introduced that structure AI, but only through the Milky Way. And that's a really nice and effective way to actually just build effects up. So I'm gonna go a little heavy handed and just go even more on the actual Milky Way. And now I may actually just paint a little bit of that over these rocks here. All right, let's see our before and our after. Okay, not too bad. Let's jump back into the tools and see what else we can do. Currently for a night photo, I feel our sky is just a little bit too bright. So I'm going to address that and I'm gonna do it with the develop tool again. See, I said I was gonna keep things simple in terms of the editing. So we're just revisiting the tool that we've already used. Currently, we're only two edits deep. So we've been able to achieve quite a lot if I toggle our before, and our after just with those two tools that you can see in the edits tab here, the develop and the structure. So let's see if we can add to that with the develop tool. And this time I just want to darken down some of the sky. So the easiest way to do that is just grab the exposure slider and bring that down. I don't want to darken down too much of the Milky Way. And because that is a brighter area, I'm thinking if we grab the highlight slider and move that up, we can keep that a little brighter. What about the shadows? Let's see. What if we take those down and we darken that sky even more? And currently we're affecting the whole picture, as you can see if I toggle that on and off, but that is not concerning me at the moment because I know that I can always jump into my masking section. Any effect I create, any tool that I use, I can look at it affecting the whole photo, but I don't need to panic thinking, oh, it's affecting the rocks, making them too dark, because I know that I can just jump back into my masking section. And for this one, I could either brush it in or probably what's a better approach is to grab the linear gradient tool and we can click at the top drag down and I'm going to drag towards the Milky Way and release. And if I go back to my adjustments, we're going to see that effect applied to that top part there. So if I look at our before and our after, now we're literally just darkening down the very top of the sky. If we want to refine the mask further, we just jump back into that masking section. We can either use the linear gradient tool again, or in this case, I might just come to the brush and this time I'm going to start painting this effect in. I'll move the strength slider up to about a third so that I can get this done just a little bit quicker. And I just click once and I paint and I'm just going to come in underneath the Milky Way here. There we go. And then I may just darken up this left hand side a little bit too. As always, if you think Luminar Neo would be a good fit for your photo editing, go ahead and use the discount link in the description below. I've also got a discount code down there. Helps you guys out, also helps me out. I get a small commission from Skyland, which is great. Just helps me keep creating this free content for you guys. Also in a bit, I'll be covering what I consider to be the absolute best in terms of noise reduction and also AI sharpening. So I'll put a link to those things in the description as well. By no means is this a sponsored video or anything like that. It's purely my opinion on that. So if it's of interest, check it out. But for now, let's carry on with the edit. And if there's any areas where you feel like you've gone too heavy handed, just come in, switch to the erase tool and we can click and then just take that away. So I'll just remove it a little bit more from the Milky Way. And let's toggle our before and after, before and after, heading in the right direction. You guys who follow my channel regularly will know I will often go really deep with these tools and we'll often end up with multiple tools that make up our edit. But I said in this one, I was going to try and keep things a little more simplified and that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna jump into Enhance AI, which as I showed you earlier, does a lot to our photo. So I'm just gonna crank the Accent AI all the way to 100 and see what it's doing, see what I like, see what I don't like. And it, the easiest way to do that is just using the eyeball tool to see your before and your after. Before and after, 
and absolutely it's made a bit of a dog's dinner of our photo overall but again I'm just going to come in with my masking tools and I'm just going to paint this effect in where I want and what I'm liking is what it's doing to the actual Milky Way itself and perhaps some of the rock area here and so again with like a low strength somewhere around 25 is absolutely fine I'm just going to reduce my brush click and I'm just going to paint it over the Milky Way release and go okay yeah I like what that's doing what about if I put a little bit over the rocks here release okay let's have a little look how we're doing before and after always a good idea to see where you've come from where you're heading check you're happy and then just start building that effect up and it was actually starting to help just lighten up this area in the bottom left so I'll just put a little bit over there here's our before here's our after and if you feel like it's too much you can either erase it or you can jump back into the adjustments here grab the amount and just tease that back down all right here's our before here's our after pretty cool now I can't leave an edit without at least applying one of Luminar's creative tools and as you guys who know me and know my work you'll know I love mystical and sometimes I apply it just because I like it but in this case if I zoom in and then apply it you're going to see that there's actually a really useful purpose for it so I'll open this up and I've zoomed in so that we can actually see the noise that is in the photo and I'm just going to grab the amount slider and push it all the way to 100. Now if we look at our before and our after, before and after, and I'm hoping you can see something here with our before and our after. If you look at a very shadowy area, let's look at the rocks here for example which are all in shadow. If I show you our before and you look at the noise level that exists there and then I release, while the noise is still there, the mystical tool has actually visually minimized it. So here was our before, here's our after. I'll zoom back out and you can see on a bigger scale, here's our before, here's our after. Now obviously, again, 100% of the amount is far too much, but a little can go a long way. So I'm going to grab the amount and put that somewhere around 25. And now I'm going to press the backslash key so we can see our original file. And when I release, you can see how much progress we've made. I recently showed you guys how we can use a solid color in soft light mode, so the blending mode is changed to soft light rather than normal, to actually harmonize a color scheme throughout the whole photo. Now I had a comment from somebody saying, I don't really understand why you do this. So I'll use the effect over the whole photo to actually minimize color clashes and bring the spectrum into a more homogeneous, harmonized color scheme. Well that is one application for it, but in this video we're going to level up a little bit and I'm going to show you how we can use that same technique a little more creative so I can create a more dual tone color approach to this photo. You'll see exactly what I mean in a minute. Let's get back into it. So I'm going to come over to my layers palette here. I'm going to click that plus icon and I've already preloaded the solid color that I'm going to use. Now, as I've said before, it doesn't matter what color you use. And then we're going to come over here and click stretch so that it's stretched over the whole photo. And the first thing we want to do is rather than be in normal blending mode, we want to change this to soft light. And I'm going to crank the amount all the way to 100. So if I change this back to normal mode, you'll see that we just have a solid color as a layer over the top of our photo. But by changing its mode to soft light, we introduce that color, we're injecting that straight into our photo. And the reason it doesn't matter what color we use is because we have access to change the color of any layer. So we just need to open the color tool here in the essentials tab. And now if we click on the HSL tab, the hue, saturation and luminance, at the very bottom we have hue shift which is effectively a fancy way of saying color shift so now if i grab this slider and actually move that you can see the color of my whole photograph starts to change based on this hue shift so what i'm going to do just so you can see exactly what's happening i'm going to jump into my layer properties again and rather than having it in soft light i'm just going to change it to normal jump back into my edit section so i can access that color tool open up HSL again and come down and literally all I'm doing is I grab the hue shift is I'm just changing the color of that layer and that is why when we come back into the layer properties and change the blending mode to soft light we will see that whatever color that layer has become is now injected into this photo. So that's how we'd do it if we wanted to change the color toning globally and I'm just going to show you something I'm going to delete this layer he says he clicks duplicate sorry I am going to remove that layer remove this one as well and I just want to show you just in case you're wondering well why don't you just do that with a tool on this layer if I come in and I actually go into the color tool just on this layer rather than adding a solid color in that soft light mode you'll see that we do not get the same effect 
So if I come down to the hue shift and I just start grabbing this and moving it, we can change the colors, but it's changing the colors relative to what they are already. So this can be a really useful tool in certain applications, but it's not what I'm after here. So I'm gonna double click the hue shift just to reset that, and I'm just gonna come back in and load that layer back up. So we're back to where we were. Change to soft light, crank the opacity to 100, come down to color, and you'll recall that Fran was a little perturbed by the bleed from the city lights over here on the right hand side. However, rather than trying to get rid of it, I'm actually gonna use it as more of a creative element. So what I want to do is actually enhance more of a kind of orangey yellow glow from this side, and then we'll enhance more of a bluey look for the rest of the sky. So what I'm gonna do is using this red layer here, I'm gonna change our hue until things start to look a little more orangey. I'm now going to add another tool to that layer to brighten it up. So I'm just gonna jump into the develop section, grab the exposure and boost that up. We can even grab the temperature so we're adding even more orange and push that up. You know, push more of the magenta tint in there as well. And we're almost heading towards that discoloration of the original file right now, but that's okay. I'm not too worried about that because I'm just gonna mask this effect in. So if you want to mask a layer, you need to do it through the layer properties section here. So I'm gonna click that, click on masking. So I'm talking directly to this layer. And this time I'm gonna create a radial mask just over this area here. So I'm gonna click and I'm gonna drag out. And the red area of the mask is showing you where this layer is gonna be visible. So I'm gonna have that orangey effect over here on the outside of the circle. And that isn't what I want, I want the opposite, I want it here. So all I need to do is just click invert to flip that mask around. And now what I want to do is actually create more of an ellipse by dragging that in and rotating this around just so that our main effect kind of sits around this area here. And now when I jump into properties, you're gonna see that we have that effect. So we're brightening up this area of the sky and also the land here. And so if we wanna sort of refine that a little bit, we can just come back into masking. I'm gonna come out of the radial gradient, jump into my brush, and this time I'm gonna to come to the erase tool so that I can actually remove this effect. I'm gonna click once and I'm just gonna start removing it a little bit from the land mass itself. Something like that's fine. Now we just need to do the same thing, but this time we're gonna turn this layer blue. So I'm gonna open up the same color. And if you guys have clicked the join button and joined my channel as a member with downloads, I'll make sure that I put this particular color swatch in that folder so you have access to it as well. If you're not a member, no problem. You can probably find something like this pretty easily just on Google. So again, I need to stretch the color swatch. I'm gonna push the opacity all the way to 100. And this time we're gonna to come to soft light, just like last time, so I don't know why I said this time. And straight away by applying that to the whole image, you can see how that adds a sense of color harmony. So that works really nicely, but that's not what I'm gonna do here. So I'm gonna come down to the color section, come down to the hue shift again, and I'm just looking for a nice rich blue to introduce. Yep, something like that. And now I can come back up to my layer properties and come into the masking section, grab a paintbrush, make sure our size is nice and big so we can get the job done pretty quickly and I'm literally just gonna click and paint and there you can see we're gonna start adding this bluey effect in if we want to do a transition from the left hand side to the right hand side that might look pretty good we could actually just come in grab the linear gradient click and drag left to right and that doesn't replace the brushed mask that we just created as you can see it adds to it so that's a really effective way of combining masks and if we're happy with our mask, we can jump back into the properties and we can just play with the opacity slider so that we can set this where we feel it looks better. You might want a pretty extreme look at 100%, you might want a little bit of it, or in my case, oh, let's go about halfway. And you know what, because I did quite like that color harmony look when we introduced the red layer over the whole thing, ah, I'm just gonna do that anyway. Let's come over, let's reload the layer. We could duplicate what we've already got there, but that's also gonna duplicate the mask we've already created. And I don't wanna do that, so we're just gonna stretch a brand new layer over the top, come down to soft light, maybe just reduce the intensity a little bit. And there we go, let's look at our before and our after. Look how much richer this file looks now, before and after. Okay, now we're happy with the general photo edit. We need to address the issue of excessive noise and reduced sharpness. So, first things first, let's export this photo. So what can we do? Well, we can either click here and export, or what I prefer to do is just right click on the photo and come to export. 
and I'm not concerned about exporting this as a high quality TIFF with 16 bits because I've already done my edit and I'm happy with it. At this point, a JPEG should be able to hold all of the information that I need. I'm not gonna be editing this further other than reducing that noise and adding sharpness. So I'm gonna stick with an Adobe RGB color profile, which is a great profile to use. JPEG, quality 100, hit export. So one of the main issues we've got with this photograph here, and this is a common problem for night photography and any high ISO photography is digital noise. How are we gonna cope with that? Well, yes, we have Luminar's noise reduction tool and we can certainly use that to address some of the noise, but in particularly noisy images, we need a dedicated tool to tackle that. The ones inside traditional editors such as this, Lightroom, Photoshop, they just don't cut the mustard. You need a dedicated tool. And that is what I'm gonna show you now. So we're gonna to open Topaz Denoise, amazing bit of software. Come to the browse image, open up what we just created in Luminar, and there you go. Have a look at what it can do already. I haven't even changed any of the settings. It's just detected severe noise, and this is what it's done for us. If I zoom out, we can see our original, and then when it's finished calculating, there you go, it's managed to get rid of all the noise, but it's kept intact all of the stars. And that's one of the things I really love about this, that intelligence to actually identify what objects are and keep them intact while still removing all of that heavy noise. Absolutely, you can come in and play with the settings. You can turn this on to automatically detect the recommended settings. You can also choose from different rendering models as well, but normally it detects the correct one for you. So I'm happy with that. All we need to do is come to save image, I'm just gonna append the file with denoise, click save image, and it's gonna calculate our file for us. Open up Topaz Sharpen, and this time I'm gonna bring in the file that we've already run denoise on, so that's this one here, I know that. Click open, and we've loaded into a four by four view, and it's gonna go through calculating different ways of adding the sharpening. Here we have motion blur in the top right, out of focus, and also too soft as well. And then in the top left, we have the original, which isn't the true original. This is the one that's just been run through denoise. And you can click and drag to see different areas in your photo denoted by this area here. So we can just grab this little rectangle around, put it over an area we want to look at, and then it's gonna render a preview for us as to what the AI sharpening is gonna do. And the four up window allows us to compare with our original, the different rendering models that Sharpen AI allows us to use. And so we have motion blur, out of focus, and too soft. And it doesn't always correlate that the name that you think would best match your photo gives you the best result. So for example, motion blur, you can see that the AI algorithm has actually added in detail to this area here in the foreground. And so you might decide, you know what, I like this, the stars are intact, we've got more detail, it's a sharper image, let's go with that. So let's do that. Click on the window that you want to use, just click save image, and then you can export it to where you want. In my case, I'm just gonna send it back to that original folder. I've decided to go with JPEGs just for speed of processing, but absolutely you can run higher standard file formats such as TIFF through this, no problem. So we're gonna close this down and we'll jump back into Luminar Neo to our edited version which still suffers from all that noise and lack of sharpness. And I'm gonna come over to the layers section, click the plus icon, and this time I'm gonna introduce the file that we just created. So this furthest one here, this has been run through the denoise filter and the sharpness AI filter. So I'm just gonna open that and when I click on it, it's gonna get loaded over the top of our original photo that suffers from those noise and sharpness issues. And now we can use the opacity slider to decide if we want 100% of that corrected file or whether we wanna go back to the noisy original or if you just wanna sort of settle somewhere in between. So you might say, I want some of that original file, but I also want a lot, but not all of the correction that we introduced. So if I zoom to 100%, it's easier to see. This is our noise reduced and sharpened layer. And then if I hide that, we can go back and see just how noisy and soft the original file was, and then we'll show layer. We have a much better looking file, but using this layered approach, we can decide, you know what? I don't want the full correction or supposed correction. We can sit this around, say 62%, have a little bit of the original file just for believability, and then you get the best of both worlds, the noise reduction, the sharpening, and you're never gonna be looking at this at 100% zoom. Let's do fit to screen. Close down our layer properties so we lose that blue layer selection and now I'm able to use the backslash key so we can see the absolute before this was our original raw file release and here is our edited cleaned up file. So here's our before, here's our after. I think you'll agree that's quite a transformation. 
Thank you so much for watching guys. Thank you Fran Lyons for supplying the photo that we're working on. Hope you guys like the edit. What do you think to it? What have you learned from this video? Let me know in the comments. It's good to have a conversation and hopefully have you appreciated the fact that I've tried, I've tried to slow down a little bit with the delivery of information. Has that been useful to you guys? Do let me know. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. There's one popping up just here and according to the YouTube algorithm, you might like that one. So go and check it out and I will see you there.